Now, people say, well, wait a minute. What if someone believes and then they stop believing? I mean, are they really saved? Let's assume for a minute that you can believe and be saved and then stop believing and not be saved. You either never were saved or you lost your salvation. What you're saying is Jesus did not die for that particular sin. What sin are we talking about? The sin of unbelief. I mean, are you telling me that Jesus died for all the sins of the world except the sin of unbelief? Is that what you're telling me? I mean, the last time I checked, the blood of Christ was shed for the whole world. It was shed for every single sin I've ever committed, past, present, and future. His, his blood was shed for my sins long before I was born. So any sin that I commit in my post-Christian life, any sin, Drunkenness, prostitution, falling away from the things of God, unbelief, all those sins are covered as well. I understand that what I'm saying here sounds radical, but the reason it sounds radical is we don't understand grace. Grace means unmerited favor. It means favor that has come to you that you don't deserve. I don't deserve it, you don't deserve it, and while if I were running things, I would yank out the carpet from people that believe and don't anymore. But God doesn't do that because God has decided to deal with the human race on the basis of grace. Wasn't planning on going this direction, but just slip over to 2 Timothy, almost next door. 2 Thessalonians, hopscotch over 1 Timothy, and look at verse 13. 2 Timothy 2, verse 13. No, no legalist wants to bring this up in any of their teachings, but it says, if we are, what, faithless. Now, <laughs> that is in Greek an alpha privative meaning it's a Greek word that begins with the letter alpha, which is a negation. It's like how we use the letter A in English. Atheist, no God. Agnostic, no knowledge. So, so an alpha in front of the word negates the word, the rest of the word. Ah, millennialist, no millennium, etc., when it says we are faithless, that's an alpha privative, meaning in front of the word believe is the alpha, meaning without faith. Paul says we. See that? We could end up there, Paul says. Now, now, now what if I end up there, Paul says. Timothy, what if you end up there? If we are faithless, that means without faith, a Christian who doesn't want to believe anymore, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Well, why in the world would God remain faithful to a person that obviously doesn't deserve it and has gotten so messed up that they don't even want to believe anymore? Why would God do that? Because we're analyzing things through the system of justice. God does not deal with people that way. Based on his own decision, he deals with it, deals with us on the basis of grace. So this whole subject of repentance and believe, um, April 28th, I think it is, uh, Pastor Dennis Roxer is going to be here and he's going to be doing a two-part series on repentance. First in Sunday school and then in the main service, part one and part two explaining what repentance actually means from the Bible. I, I don't go around telling pastors what to name their series, but if I were naming it, I would call it Repenting from Our Understanding of Repentance. 
Because what he'll show you is repentance, when used in a justification context, is nothing more than a synonym for believe. It's not some kind of auxiliary step. Just like receive is used as a synonym for believe in our passage here and in John chapter 1, verse 12. I wonder if he was copying Joseph Prince's notes, because that's exactly what Joseph Prince says. Repent. The only repentance he ever found was repentance from understanding of repentance. It's very interesting, you know, like when you see the uh, Jesus uh, as he be began, his, even John the Baptist even, uh, but Jesus also, and the apostles, when they began their preaching ministry, it wasn't believe and repent, it was repent and believe. There's an order of, if, if you like, of, of um, in which those things occur. Um, you know, conviction of sin comes before um, faith in the remedy for it. I don't, this is really, they are not the same thing. They might be very, very closely linked, but they are not exactly the same thing. I don't think they're ever, you, you know, this, this, this thing of Andy Woods, it's just, it's disgraceful. You know, it's, it really is a license to sin, isn't it? It really is. It declares that repentance is sort of this thing that you just carry around with you as you believe. And the first words of the Gospel of Mark, excuse me, the first words of the Gospel <laughs> of Mark is repent. Uh, so if you're going yes. to figure out, like, what is the first message? And knowing Mark is probably, you know, if you believe in the the, the, the Markian uh, uh, precedence, meaning that he was the first one, you yes. know, priority, Mark and priority. And, um, you know, that Mark was could be the first gospel written. Then you have to consider the fact that the way the Holy Spirit inspired Mark to write from Peter's account is that John the Baptist says, repent. And Jesus said, repent. And um, so that there wasn't any confusion in terms of they all believed in God. There was not such a, a distinctive in terms of like, well, what do you have to believe in? Well, they all were Jews. They all were Hebrews. They they understood uh, there was only one God and they, and they believed that they had to believe in God. And But the repentance was they had fallen away from real faith, real obedience, real trust and real dependence on God. You know, and those are all not necessarily synonyms, but they're a description of somebody who is in relationship with God you know and if you have a relationship with God you need to uh, turn away from sin because God is not a, a God who tolerates sin he is inflexible unflexible towards sin so there has to be this repentance and um, of course he gives us grace because we we ultimately are not perfect he, he has to receive us even with our sins but we have to be there's to be an acknowledgement an acknowledgement of confession of sin and a turning a deliberate turning away from it and um you know, not, not referring to any kind of sinless perfection or anything like that, but a deliberate, you know, sorrow, you know, godly sorrow that comes with uh, with that repentance. And then you put your faith in Jesus. This is what Paul talked about in Acts 20, where he says, I went to the Gentiles and I preached to them repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. Acts 20, 21, I believe. Yeah. Toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. He didn't say repentance toward God or faith in Jesus Christ. He says, and so the, the, the yes. you know, his, his straw man that you have to, you know, he's building a straw man that you have, well, if you're faithless and, and you know, it, it's not a secondary issue. I mean, not a secondary issue. It's, a, it's not an additive to your, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, to your faith or anything like that. It's, 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 he's making them synonyms and he's trying to say that repentance is sort of an additive that comes with it. Um, but that's not what Paul says. It's not any of the gospel says there's always a, an end, you know, and since I know he knows Greek pretty well, I, I would think he would know that. Now in Mark chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 it says, Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Notice it says, Repent and believe. Repent and believe. If they mean the same thing, why did Mark, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, choose to use both words? Why didn't he just write, believe and believe, or just believe if Andy Woods is correct? No, it's because these words have different and distinct meanings. Now, there may be a correlation between certain words, 
but that certainly does not make them synonyms. I know there are believers who, you know, are sort of this this hyper dispensational that believe somehow Acts is a different dispensation than the Gospels. And Paul literally almost quotes the exact same thing that Jesus and, 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 um, and John the Baptist would have said. But Jesus said, repent and believe. Paul says repentance toward God, clarified it to Gentiles because they needed to uh, understand a little bit more, you know, as he was talking to uh, Gentiles. And he says, you know, repentance toward God. You know, I declare to both Jews and Gentiles, he says, that they must re have repentance toward God and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So th that, that idea of Lord is, of course, you know, you have to turn to him, you know, and, and, and follow him on the basis of, of his word as the authority in your life. So it is interesting the way he puts it, and I, I don't. I think it's less than honest because I think it will confuse a lot of young Christians who who read it and say, "Well, that's obviously two different things, two things that God, you know, requires of yeah. me." And um, but he says, "No, it's, it's it's just one." So once you move repentance out of that equation, I think as Andy was referring to, it, it is a licentious lifestyle that you can have because. If all I have to do is keep believing, why would John the Baptist and Jesus tell the Jews to repent? Because they yeah. already had faith. They already had faith. Now, it was a corrupt faith. It was a, a faith that had been corrupted over the years. And surely they needed to believe the gospel for sure. Um, but it, it, Jesus gave them two different things to, to do, you know, and, um, and, and to Andy's point, repentance is first faith comes uh, out of that repentance, because that's the next, that would be the next step in terms of, you know, not only confession of sin, understanding yeah. that you have sinned against the Holy God, but turning away from that sin that offends a Holy God, and now putting your faith in the only one who can save you, which is Jesus Christ. Under, under Andy Woods's system, if you can call it that, you, basically apostasy is impossible. I mean, I mean, you can you can walk away from the Lord, blaspheme and curse His name, blaspheme the Holy Spirit, or something like that, and you'd still get raptured at the end of it. Um, it it's impossible to uh, offend God so much that you um, that you lose your salvation. That's actually t a terrifyingly awful message to, to give people. I mean, what? Why bother? Why does Paul bother even um, exhorting people to walk in, in holiness if um, it doesn't matter? Yeah, he, he makes this issue of, of grace. I don't want to jump too much around from the the, the uh, uh, but I think it's really because he, he, he talks about it. I think that's like his platform is the dealing with with grace. Now, he says grace is this unearned favor. And, and it is true. It is it's the word uh charis in in in, in greek it's uh, the word grace you know we it's a translated gift translated kindness it, it is describing the kindness of god in which we see in the old testament the word hesed in the old testament uh in the word charis which can mean grace gift uh kindness favor in the new testament translated different ways but it's 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 the same word charis and the idea here of grace he says it's 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 how he deals with us I don't, I don't disagree with that. I, I think if God dealt with us because of our sins, we would all be done. We would be, oh, yeah. we'd be able to stand, as the psalmist says. Uh, who can stand? But because of grace, and in, in the Old Testament, and it's clear, it is the, the, the mercy of God, you know, grace given to us uh, because of the covenant, hesed, because of the covenant. And so God deals with kindness, dealt with kindness toward Israel. Uh, Manasseh is a great example of God's kindness in the Old Testament. Well, the same thing in the New Testament. It, it is because of grace, but grace was given so that we would stop sinning. Yes. That we he would deal with our sins and that we would stop sinning. As Paul tells Titus, you know, that it was the grace that came, the grace of God that came that helps us in Christ reject ungodliness. Ungodly living has to be rejected and and and, and deals with our sinful desires. You know, so God trains us through his grace and teaches us to avoid behaviors that are sinful. That's what grace yes. is. It's, it, it, that's the, the Titus um, 2.12. And right before the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's talking about the blessed hope, and which is the appearance of Jesus. And so it's, it's, it's interesting that he talks about grace, but he doesn't deal with 
why this grace was given to us. Why, why did God have so much kindness toward us in Jesus? Is the fact that we cannot attain salvation on our own. We can't really mm -hmm. be saved through our own works, our own efforts, our own uh, merit. It has to be the merit of Christ at the cross in which he's our substitute. Then that grace is given to us so that we don't go on sinning. Because yeah. if God just would have forgiven us, we would have gone back to the same thing. You know, but he's put his spirit in us uh, to deal with sin. Just, he's talking yeah. about the fact that he's, this is the true understanding of grace. This is, you know, you don't understand grace. Well, I don't think he understands it either. Yeah. Because he says, well, grace is given to us. So no matter how we live, we can go on and, and just with belief. And it doesn't matter if we're faithless. It doesn't matter if we, you know, uh, he talks about drunk or prostitute and stuff like that. And uh, um, he never tells anybody. And obviously, you know, the, the whole message, people are going to listen to the whole message. Never tells anybody to repent, believe, and, and stop living like this. You know, when I became a Christian, you know, thank God I, I didn't hear that kind of message. You know, I was told, you know, the, you know, no sexual morality. You have to turn away from that. No um ungodliness you know pride ego you know all that had to go and i had to really uh, really take account of my life and how i've offended god and that was the gospel message that, that i receive is that i have offended god by my life and so if i needed to walk with god which i did see a need to be forgiven a need for god that was the um uh, th that was the message that uh, the, the gospel gives you have to turn away from mm -hmm. sin you know? Did I become sinless at that very moment? Absolutely not. You know, I yes. struggle. Took some time. God began to, you know, take away that ungodliness in my life. It didn't come overnight, but over time, through grace, I was able to overcome things I never would have thought I could overcome. Uh, but it was only yeah. the grace of God that helped me to reject ungodly living. Uh, but if had I listened to to Andy, uh, Mr. Wood, yeah. I, I would have yeah. probably continued in it and thought, well. As long as I can believe, then I would have, um, I probably would have continued in sin. I just need to believe. And I would have told my girlfriend, I just believe, you know, I I'm okay. <laughs> We're okay. I just believe. Yeah. You know? And it's sort of like the same message that we hear, unfortunately, a lot in, in, in different, uh, in, in the Christian arena, is that we don't have to have, uh, you know, any fruit or repentance, any sign that we turn away and, um, you know, from our ungodly living before we became a Christian. Uh, but as long as I believe, you know, and, and I, I, unfortunately, sometimes parents have this, um, you know, sentimental view of their children because of this message. They said, well, you know, my kids are not following the Lord and they're not following God and they're, you know, doing drugs. I said, but they believe, pastor, they believe, you know, and I had to tell them, I said, well, if they really believe they would follow Jesus and walk with him and, yeah. and be like, him. because that's really the point of salvation is to become like Jesus. Now God has given us the grace to become like Jesus. Andy Woods is taking that thing about from Second Timothy, where it says, "If we remain, if we are faithless, He remains faithful." And he's 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 setting it against just about every other <laughs> thing that Paul says about walking. I mean, you only have to look like in Hebrews. I mean, I'm just let me get Hebrews open. Um, yeah, Hebrews chapter three, where you know, because the you know the the um, the people he was writing to in um, uh, in the letter to the Hebrews, you know, the the general consensus is that they were experiencing severe persecution, and they were right. thinking of returning back to uh, Judaism to uh, to kind of avoid the uh, the problems they were experiencing. But you know, um, <clears throat> Paul talks there of. Um, and um, he says, you know, don't harden your hearts as you, as you won't enter into his rest um, and to God's rest. And then and he says, for we are for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the provocation for some when they heard did provoke. Uh, however, not all that came out of Egypt through Moses, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. And then Paul goes on to say, let us therefore fear, as the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should come 
short of it. You know, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You know, so, um, you know, you know, the writer to the Hebrews, presumably Paul, we, we believe, um, says no. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, <laughs> unbelief, it can be real unbelief, it can be a killer. He's not talking about moments of doubt or wavering. He's talking about really turning away. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be in Andy Woods's shoes on on Judgment Day when the Lord uh, presses him about this, about what he's been saying. You can just wander off, cease believing and, and not worry about it. It's terrifying. It was the sin of us that kept uh, Israel from entering into the promised yes, land. Yes, yes. Uh, Twelve spies came and ten had bad report, and Joshua and Caleb had the good report, and they believed the bad the bad report of the um, of the ten uh, ten spies, and it was because of unbelief. A Kadesh Barnea, they fell into yes. unbelief, and the Bible refers to this in the Psalms as well as the New Testament, Jude, Book of Hebrews, refers to this. First Corinthians ten. Uh, refers to this as a moment where they that first generation fell into unbelief and they stopped trusting and depending on the Lord because that's really what unbelief is. It, you know, Andy was makes it this sort of like a, a, a mental thing. You know, like oh, I just believe I have a mental idea of God. I have a belief. I have a belief system. You know, and um, but he doesn't really deal with the word unfaithful or, or unbelief. It's the idea of. You're not trusting in God anymore. You know, you would say if a man is unfaithful to his wife, doesn't really want to be with his wife. You know, he may have a, a you know, it was a mistake. It was an error. It was a great sin, of course. But that unfaithfulness took his love away from his wife toward another person. And that mm -hmm. is exactly what Israel did. They, they took God's, you know, God's love, rejected it and put their heart and mind into what they wanted to do. And ultimately, idolatry was at the heart of it. They were unfaithful. Now, God, who is true. And God, who is faithful, uh, didn't let him get away with it and told that first generation, you're not getting in. You're not getting in because of unbelief. And let this, so the writer of Hebrews, you're absolutely right, Andy, makes the point that don't let that same thing happen to you. Yeah, yeah. You that's the whole point of the letter, heart. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you don't get that heart because you see the example of what happened. And like I said, Paul talks about it. Jude talks about it. The letter of Hebrews talks about it. The psalmist talks about it. So I think it's repeated a few times in the Bible for our, our understanding and learning. Paul makes that case in Corinthians. This was written for us so that we wouldn't have the same, we wouldn't follow and copy the same, uh, the same sin. And that, that was their biggest, that was, that was the beginning of everything you can say that happened to Israel after that in the wilderness. You know, their unbelief, their complaint, uh, um, sorry, yes. their idolatry and complaining and murmuring and turning against Moses was due to the fact that very early on, within the first year and a half, they fell into unbelief and God was angry with them. And it says in the, in the psalmist and in, in Exodus and Hebrews, it says that God was angry with them because of unbelief, because God wanted them to follow him. And he had given them promises to enter to the promise. Yes. God will give it to them. It, and Caleb and Joshua re reiterated what Moses had said, and they would not believe. And so they couldn't get in. Another point also to add to this, you know, um, Woods was talking about um, that word in... Um, 2 Timothy 2, 13, uh, apistis, which means um, you know, faithless or unbelieving. But you have the same word in Revelation 21, verse 8, you know, and where it talks about, the, you know, those outside the city are those who are faithless, apistis, uh, idolaters, you know, um, murderers, fornicators, and all this. Uh, and their destiny, you know, and their, their, their um, destination is the lake of fire. Um, you know, so uh, it's serious. Uh, unbelief is serious. Hey, Marco, you just reminded me that something else he makes a sin in him. The blessed hope is the rapture. But did you hear that? You can have a post-Christian life and be saved? I mean, really? How is that even possible? And then what are we to do with the warnings like in Luke 17, 32, where Jesus is telling us, remember Lot's wife. Now, things didn't work out too good for Lot's wife, did they? Just a thought. I mean, you know, if you can walk away from Christ, walk away from faith, and God won't condemn you for it because of grace, 
And really, why is God condemning the rest of the world who don't believe? You know, that's the other side to it. You know, um, you know, if you can be faithless to Christ, after, you know, after having received Him and just by walking away, then and you can go, what, and still be saved. Then why is the Lord condemning the world for not believing? Yeah. You know, um, it, it it just makes a mockery of the gospel, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah. Yeah, well, why would he call us to be faithful to him? You know, why would he call us to to follow him? Every single person that comes to Jesus is called to follow Jesus. You know, it, it, you know, I think he's he's convoluting the idea that, well, yeah, I don't think any Christian is going to be uh, perfect along the way of his walk, but that doesn't mean he's faithless. That doesn't mean he. You referred to earlier, Andy. It's, it's you know point of maybe a lapse in judgment, maybe uh, a sin that creeps in so easily besets us. As the Book of Hebrews, maybe you um, you know fell into sin for a period of time. You know you repented of it, you came out of it. Maybe uh, um, you know doubts creep in your mind. These are things that every believer goes through in, in some form yeah. or another. But there is repentance, there is grace, there's grace to come back. But the the, the point of the matter is God puts us right back into a life of holiness, which that's what He he calls us because without, you know, without holiness, nobody will see the Lord, says the writer of Hebrews. So yeah. I don't think um, Andy deals with that. I don't think he wants, to, not this Andy, but the other Andy, uh, Mr. Woods, I want to deal yeah. with that. Yes. Uh, uh, I think that would really hamper, I think, his argument. Uh, going back to uh, repentance and, 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 and faith uh, in the grace of God that has given us, you know, when Paul dealt with Agrippa, King Agrippa in the book of Acts, I think it's Acts 20, 19, uh, 26, sorry, Acts 26. He says, King Agrippa, I have been obedient to the heavenly vision. So notice what he says. Yeah. I was obedient to the heavenly vision. This is what Jesus told him to do. So I went to Damascus. I went to Jerusalem and to everybody in the region of Judea and to the Gentiles. So it's not just referring to Jews, just in case people want to make it uh, only, you know, a hyper dispensational idea. This was only a message to the, to the, to the Hebrews. It says, I declare that they should repent and turn from sin and turn to God and do the works, or the, actually the deeds, actually the word, it would be like an action, yeah. and do the actions, performing the actions worthy of repentance. Or in other words, yeah. uh, keep with repentance. Notice Paul did not say, I preached to them so they would believe. That's, of course, implied that the message has to be that they have to turn and they have to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Of course, he said that already, repentance toward God and faith in Jesus. But here Paul is making the, 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 that the heavenly vision, the heavenly vision, which was Christ, told him to go, and he was faithful to that. He was obedient to that call to tell those in Judea, Samaria, uh, sorry, uh, Jerusalem, to the Gentiles, Damascus, and the Gentiles, that they needed to turn from their sin, turn to God, and demonstrate that they had repented, demonstrate they had repented by the way they lived. So it, it's pretty clear Paul is, is making this case that he was obedient to that vision that Christ told him to do. What is the most evangelistic book in the Bible? Does anybody know? John. John's Gospel. That's why in John's Gospel, the word believe occurs 99 times. That's a lot of usages. How many usages of the word repentance do we find in John's Gospel? Anybody want to take a guess? Zero. Goose egg. Nada. So if the word repentance and the inclusion of the word repentance in evangelism was so important the way people make it sound, explain to me why the only evangelistic book of the Bible doesn't use the word repentance once. Well, you make you wonder why the word repentance is even in the Bible then, doesn't it really? I mean, there are, there's a number of occasions in um, like John's gospel. I'm just, I'll just bring some things up here. Um, this is when Jesus, in John chapter 8, 31, and, and, and Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And then they say to him, well, look, we're Abraham's seed, and we've never been in slavery to any man. How can you say 
you shall be made free. And he says, Amen, Amen, I say to you, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And he goes on, you know, and, um, uh, you know, you can see that even though they believed, there was a heart attitude problem. You know, they didn't want to be told that they were sinners. They could see that the miracles that he did, but they didn't like the idea of repentance of acknowledging their sinful condition and their need of salvation. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of puts, uh, you know, that believe is not a simple, it's not the way that Andy Woods describes it. Absolutely right, uh, uh, Andy. The But the, the ignoring of the harmony of the Gospels, you know, we have four different accounts of Jesus. Even if you just want to make John, this, you know, this idea that John doesn't talk about it, which I believe he does in John 3. But what do you do with the other ones from Mark and Matthew, yeah. Luke, when clearly, yeah. unless, you know, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's to me, it's, it boggles my mind to think that um, somebody can just uh, a teacher, a Bible teacher, a pastor for a long time, you know, respected by others uh, would not include something so obvious that we always take the harmony of the gospels together. You know, we do that with the resurrection. We do that with evangelism. We do that with the ascension. Uh, we even take it from acts because there is a, a recording of acts. So all these things are put together yeah. there can have the full picture like a tapestry and uh it, and, and i believe many teachers have said that I'm not the only one who have said that it's it's really the the complete picture of jesus and, and you have to include revelation as well uh to see yes you know, yeah. more there so why is this um omission of that hermeneutical teaching or understanding uh not taught not not presented as, as a as a balancing you know as a balancing point to what he's saying uh it boggles my mind to think that that is it's something maybe maybe obvious to me but maybe not obvious to other people but i think it's pretty obvious to you know even the average pastor average believer that hey we have five accounts four accounts of jesus in the gospels we have acts and we have revelation yeah let's put them together and figure out what Jesus ultimately said, because it's the whole of God's word that is true. And uh, and this is how yeah. we get in error, is when we just take an isolation from each other. And, and I'm not even validating yes. this with Andy Woods, because I do think that that um, it is pre pretty clear in the scriptures that uh, belief is not repentance. And that even if he says it's only, you know, belief only occurs in John, doesn't talk about repentance, I would disagree. Uh, but even if you're going to make that extreme case, what about the other Gospels? What about Acts, which the disciples weren't to preach the exact message that Jesus gave them? What about Paul, where he says, I was, I was, a, I was faithful, I was obedient to the heavenly vision, and he went to preach repentance. So there's lots of questions that you could ask um, regarding his statements, and I don't know if he answers them. I don't know if he has, uh, but those are things that are, I think, very important to note it's a there's a harmony of the gospels there's acts there's revelation uh to give us a complete picture of what jesus said about faith second thessalonians where paul talks about uh christ coming and this is in chapter one where prefaces uh he's describing what yes. will happen uh before the day of the lord and he's giving encouragement to the thessalonians in terms of what they're going through he talks about persecution they're under heavy yes. persecution because he talks about their steadfastness in their faith despite the afflictions and persecution and this is evidence of the judgment of god he says you may consider worthy of the kingdom which are also suffering so this persecution which is related to what jesus said uh, in terms of persecution before his coming uh, the thessalonians were dealing with that but he talks about when the lord is revealed from heaven and with his yeah. angels he says there'll be a, a flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know god and those who do not obey the gospel. Yes, the gospel, yeah. They have to make a synonyms in order to fit. Otherwise, yes. you would have to describe each, you know, each verse within its context and each verse with other co the context of other of other scriptures. So uh, I, I'm just uh, just wondering, you know, the fact that, you know, it says clearly that he's going to judge those who do not know God and don't obey the gospel, you know, not those who don't believe the gospel, those who don't obey the gospel. 
Well, I'm afraid that's another word he likes to actually redefine, the word obey. Let me show you this clip. You continue on in verse 8, and it says, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God. Now look at this. To those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, almost every works salvationist I know of will quote a verse or a verse like it. And they will say, look, the condition here is obedience. Unless you're obedient to God, you're not a Christian. The condition for justification is obedience to God. And then they'll lay out a list of things that you have to do, external works, you know, to be made right with God. But when you slip down to verse 10, he explains what obedience is. I mean, how do you obey God so that you can be saved? You obey God by fulfilling his condition that he requires of lost people, which is to believe. So if you look at verse 10, it says, when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed. See that? For our testimony to you was believed. So when he uses this word obey in this context, he's not saying, you know, don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls who do, and all, and all of these sort of man-made regulations. What he's saying is you need to obey God, meaning obey God's condition. And what is God's condition for eternal life? To believe in the one he has sent. So if a person has never believed or trusted in the work of the Savior, then they are disobedient to the condition. So you have to define obedience here very, very carefully. Going back to John 3.36, you'll notice that the word believe is defined as obey. It says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son, obey the Son meaning what? Meaning obey the Son fulfilling his condition to believe. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So why is it that today people in the world are under the wrath of God and hurling towards the judgment of God? It's because they haven't obeyed God. Obeyed God to do what? Obeyed God to come to Christ via the condition that he has outlined, which is to believe in the Son. Now, did you notice what Andy Woods is doing there? First, he has to demean those who may disagree with him by labeling them as legalists. But then notice how he goes on to frame the rest of the argument. He never once mentions anything from the word of God that was to be obeyed. No, he, he deliberately frames his argument in such a way as to make it about man-made regulations. What did he say? <laughs> uh, don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls who do, or whatever that thing was. But you get the point. He was always making the argument, framing it in such a way that it's always about man-made commitments. Totally forgetting that in the word, Jesus actually tells us that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He's deliberately being deceptive there, and it's by design. But going back to that verse in John 3.36, he is not equating the two. He's not making them synonyms. It's just like in Proverbs, where you have the one part, and then you have a deeper explanation with the second part. There is a correlation between the words, but they are not synonyms. You know, he talks about what, you know, what Paul taught the Thessalonians. But if you look at 1 Thessalonians, um, <clears throat> Paul writes to them uh, and he's saying, that, you know, um, I'll, just, I'll just get down to verse 5. And he says, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. Um, and uh, just hold on. Uh, and you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers or imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. 
For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God is spread abroad, so that we do not need to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had to you, and how you turned from God, to turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So, you know, there's your repentance and faith. They, they, you know, he didn't, Paul did not preach to them a repentanceless, a, re, a repentanceless gospel. You know, That's they right. repented. They didn't just, you know, mentally. It, it's just, you know, Woods is really, really twisting the word of God horribly. Yeah, he's redefining terms. No, he's, he's just ignoring. Yes. Yeah. And ignoring this is out and out false teaching. You know, it's I'm interesting sure. that in, in, in Corinthians, there's almost the same case, Andy, where he talks about such were some of you, you know, yes, that you were washed, you, you know, you have been regenerated, you have been uh cleansed by the blood of Jesus and and, and not the washing of the Holy Spirit, of course. And Titus talked about regeneration, so it, it, it such were some of you, it, it, it indicates the fact that they had turned from that. And Paul rebukes the Corinthians for going back. To their sinful yes. ways that they were yeah. divisive that they were suing each other that they were immoral um i mean he should have just let them go and said as long as you guys believe that should have been sufficient and he reminds them that such were some of you so they had left that uh, lifestyle they had left those sins and so yeah. it, it is it, it is a point where you have to take the counsel of god's word and it's in its fullness and its whole especially in the new testament and, and i don't even know what he does with the book of james where James just talks about you know your your, your faith being uh, you know being evident by your actions, um, but I guess you would just have to say that James was not written to believers. It was written to some kind of you know some kind of um, subjective uh, um, what would they call it dispensation a subjective dispensation. This was written to yeah. Hebrews, not to the New Testament believers Gentiles. You know I've seen people make those cases, but. I think if you put the whole word of God in the New Testament, um, especially the New Testament, which we're quoting, uh, to the test and say, does the word repentance and faith, uh, are they do they go together? Yes. Are they the same? Are they the same thing? No. But they are theologically connected. It's like the word grace and mercy. Yeah. I don't think any of us would say that they're the same thing, but they're often used in the same context to describe similar things that go together you know it's the grace of yeah. god but we also have mercy which is which is a different word well let's have a look at how he handles james too okay the bible says 160 times there is only one condition to be justified before god which is to believe in jesus well well pastor the demons believe and tremble every legalist you'll ever run into will take you through james 2:19 the demons believe too, and they tremble. Okay. That's what we call an apples and oranges comparison. Number one, is the plan of salvation open to the demons? No. Is the plan of salvation open to human beings? Yes. So when you throw in James 2, verse 19, you're throwing in together two concepts that don't fit, number one. Number two, in James 2, do you find the word Jesus in James 2? The demons believe and tremble. The word Jesus isn't even in there in that particular verse. So it's not even a gospel presentation. Acts 4 verse 12, when we're evangelizing, we mention the name Jesus. We have to because there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So when you run over to James chapter 2 verse 19 and you try to attack faith alone in Christ alone and, 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 and say, well, the demons believe as well. I mean, number one, you just mix two things that shouldn't go together. You mixed human salvation with the condition of the demons who have no opportunity for salvation. And number two, you're throwing together the name of Christ with a, with a passage that doesn't even mention Jesus. I mean, all it says is the demons believe there is one God and tremble. 
And actually, when you study this in James 2, what Paul, uh, James there, the half-brother of Christ, is doing is he is trying to encourage the saved to having productive faith, useful faith. Not just saving faith, but a serving faith. Saving faith saves. Now be productive in your daily life is what the point of the book of James is. And he's using a ridiculous argument. Uh, I think the logicians would call it absurdio reductium or something like that. About as complicated as the apex in one's prostate, but it's, it's, this, it's this idea that, of course, your faith should produce good works because it even produces a work in the demons. The demons believe there is one God and it produced something. They're afraid. They're trembling. So if <laughs> truth um, produces something, that should happen in your life as well as a Christian. It even happens with the demons. And let me give you the most ridiculous, let me give you the most absurd argument I can come up with to communicate my point. That's what James is saying there. He's not getting into this, he's not uh, attacking faith alone in Christ alone as the way of salvation. So all, all these uh, people out there that are teaching this very distorted gospel and they're all over the internet teaching this. And they all have these runaway bestsellers on Amazon. And they have specific chapters in their books about deception, warning about the deception of believe only. Folks, <laughs> if you move away from believe only as a condition for justification, that's the deception. In some ways, actually, he's more dangerous than Kenneth Copeland or Benny Hinn. What James is saying is, you know, the, the faith that we have needs to be accompanied, obviously, with the actions, and, and that's the word works there, erge. Uh, it has to be uh, actions that accompany faith. And he's trying to divide, <laughs> and you got this common thing that, that is done, faith, you know, there's a saving faith, and there's serving faith, and this kind of faith. And, and so you end up with like four or five different kinds of faith in some of these uh, speculations that people have and I don't know where they get it from because it's it keeps being the same word over and over and over again and uh, but they 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 apply it i guess in different ways as to say that is different than saving faith which is inconsistent it's the same word uh but what what james is addressing and obviously he's talking about that um in, in that chapter i think it's verses 14 to 19 and it's in the context he's addressing as it were um hecklers that would come up and say well what about people that have only faith <laughs> and he's addressing that a uh, hypothetical issue where uh you could imagine a heckler saying well what about this what about having just simply faith and james responds very simply you know if you go to like verse you know uh, 14 15 and 16 he addresses the issue what if you just have love but no action and then you just tell somebody go you know be warm be filled go in peace you know, just That's you know, right, yeah. don't take care of their physical needs. Well, what kind of love is that, right? That's the point of James. What kind of love is that? If love is not accompanied with true loving actions. Yeah. And that obviously anybody would be ridiculous. It's ridiculous to think that way, isn't it? That if you just love somebody and say, well, man, you're destitute of all kinds of earthly things and, and earthly goods, and I have them, but I, I still love you, but I'm not going to share with you anything. So you, you would think that that's a bad love. And I think everybody agrees. Well, on the same token, I think that's James's point, uh, verse 17 and on, is that if, if faith is without action, it's like love without real compassion in, in terms of yeah. uh, real actionable terms of love. Faith has to have actionable terms. It has to be active. It has to, it has to work, for lack of a better term. And, uh, and he proposes this idea that there are those who just say, I believe. And, and even the demons say that. So there are people that say that. But at the same time, demons obviously are not going to be saved. And so that kind of, he's separating the demon's faith versus, you know, somebody having faith. But that's not the point of James. The point James is saying is if you only had words, if you only had words, 
what good does that do? Right. Yes. If you only have words, <laughs> let's say I, I believe or you know whatever, I I accept, I accept Jesus, but there was no action behind that faith. Right. It's as good as anyone saying it. You know, if you just have words, it doesn't do any good. And so James's point is, is exactly that, that I will show you by my faith, by my actions. Man, look at my actions. I have actions, I have faith, and they both go hand in hand together. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it is a, I don't say controversial passage, but it is a passage that uh, people take it one way or take it the other way. And, and I think if you just read it for face value, the context of what James is trying to say, because later on he goes on to say, just like a body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without action. So there's another comparison. The other comparison is, well, what good is a body without a spirit? You know, what good is you know <clears throat> love without actionable compassion? What is faith without action? They're simply words. In those verses he used, didn't James use two other examples to illustrate the point he was making? Didn't he use that of Abraham and Rahab to make his point? I mean, are they apples and oranges comparisons too? No, he's using three examples to make one point, and that is that faith without action is dead. Yeah, I mean, it, it's brilliant. It's brilliant the way James put it together. I mean, everybody it's knows Abraham was a father of faith, yet he doesn't talk about the time where he believed in God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed God, you know, it was accounted for him for righteousness. Uh, he actually, James goes to the part where he actually uses his faith and action and responds to God in obedience. And it said, Abraham was justified when he offered up Isaac. Isn't that interesting? It, it really goes yeah. against the grain of what Woods is trying to say. And then also Rahab. Uh, yeah. Rahab, you know, said she believed, but what was her point of justification was where she put her action uh, to her faith. And, and that's James's point. You could believe, but is it, it when it comes to obedience, it's going to it's going to justify your faith. It's going to justify your faith in that response. And and Abraham did it. Rahab did it. And so I I I have no no qualms with what James is saying. I have no qualms with you know saying that faith needs to have obedience in order to be a valid faith. Uh, but Andy, back to you. Yeah, I was going to also say that you know a biblical faith. I mean. Um, is is a, a saving faith in a sense is a response to really the the message of the gospel. Now, if you are taught that, um, like for example, Todd White came over here uh, a few mm -hmm. years ago. You know, he was going around laying hands on people with who supposedly had various ailments. And they they said they felt better, and then and then they would say that they believed in Jesus or something that he was you know giving. Yeah. But he never he never challenged them with sin, the holiness of God, and all of this. It was just look, God loves you. Oh, you know, he'll fix your neck for you or whatever. If it would be you no, know, or lengthen your leg to match the other one. There were lots of those. Apparently, there was an epidemic of people with odd legs when Todd White came to town. Um. So so in other words. Is that a saving faith? If they've never been, you know, I mean, if we've not confronted with the holiness of God and our rebellion against God um, and the penalty for that, and then also told, you know, um, the solution to that in Christ's atoning death, then, you know, we, we, we've only got um, a partial, we haven't really heard the gospel. So how can you respond in faith to something that is, is is incorrect how can you have biblical faith when you've been, you've been told something that is not all there or even false in some cases what worries me about andy woods's message is i think it'll a lot of false converts you get and get from that it's easy cheap believism now one of the other things that got me with that passage is he says that jesus wasn't even in that passage yet the passage mentions god now isn't jesus god isn't he part of the godhead yes it, it's very messed up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because if it, 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 he is there, it's in verse one. I talked about the, the, the Jesus Christ. You know, he, they said, "My brothers and sisters, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of favoritism." So he does talk about faith in Jesus Christ from chapter two all the way down, 
and what that faith looks like in terms of if you have, you know, if you have genuine faith, that this is true faith, that this is what faith looks like, then it ought to be faithful to the message, as, as um, Andy was talking about, faithful to the message that you heard about Jesus Christ. So yeah, Woods is wrong. Jesus does appear in that context. It's in chapter two, verse one, but I don't know why he didn't mention that. But, you know, I, then again, I don't know if many Christians will go back to their Bible and look at it. So when you believe, you automatically repent. When you repent, you automatically believe. The two are the way the New Testament uses those words in terms of our justification. It uses those as synonyms. So people say, well, should we believe or should we repent? And the answer would be yes. Because when you believe, in other words, trust in Christ, you automatically changed your mind, which is what the word repentance means. Meta change, as in metastasize, no AO, notion, things that come out of the mind. Meta, no AO, literally means to change your mind. So when we preach the gospel here, we don't say, okay, first you need to believe, secondly you need to repent, thirdly you need to emote. And the reason we don't do that is because the New Testament gives one condition for justification, which is faith, rightly understood, which is a synonym for believe, which is a synonym for repent. You changed your mind. You can't you cannot identify the two things, the two concepts, uh, faith and repentance, as being one, as being synonyms. They're clearly not. Yeah, um, two different words, you two know, different Greek words, two different, uh, even in the context. Uh, they they are related, different. yes, of yeah. course they are. Yeah. They are related. Um, they're theologically related. Um, but you can't have a, a, a genuine faith in Christ without repentance and that means you know acknowledging your just knowing your you know a heart knowledge of your sinful condition uh and conviction of sin without that you, you know why would you even want to believe in christ yeah. you, you know there's no need for it is there if 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 you don't do not realize your sinful condition um obviously that was a part of the problem with simon magus you know that that kooky guy <laughs> he said that he believed and he was baptized yes. but peter said i perceive you're still in the in the you know you're still a servant of iniquity that you thought that you could buy the gift of god with money you know um and simon That's was right. actually he said you know pray for me that what you just said to me what, what happened to me you know you know he right. did not fully realize that he was um you know he was dead in his sins it makes the same case like you know grace has to be understood Faith has to be understood, he says. Uh, but the understanding that he gives is not scriptural understanding. It's the way he defines it. So uh, I guess in order for really understanding, yes. we have to agree with him. And if anybody disagrees with them, then it's not, you know, it's not the biblical thing. And, and so this idea of, of synonyms, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, that, that, you know, you only have to have faith to be, to be justified. Um, well, what do we do with the book of Acts then when Paul... The same Paul who wrote Romans uh, went around preaching yeah. repentance. He says he didn't go around preaching faith. He says went around preaching repentance. Now it's implied that when he went to these, he uh, he told them they needed to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ because that's also what he said in Acts twenty one uh, twenty twenty one. So, but you have passages like Acts twenty six where it says that went around teaching repentance. So yeah. he he got to deal with those passages as well where you know there, there's a lot of hermeneutical um, errors that happen sometimes where you just take one verse and you pin it against the other and you pick the one that suits yeah. you and you ignore the other ones or you just explain it away instead of holding them in tension, yeah. holding them in a balanced way and say both things can be right, both things are right at the same time. He makes it one or the other. Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Notice this expression here, did not receive. Now, receive is a synonym for believe. That's how the two words, we understand what synonyms are, different word, same meaning. That's how it's used in John chapter 1, verse 12. 
But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Look at this. Even to those who believe in his name. So should I receive Christ or should I believe in Christ? And the answer is yes, right? Because they're synonyms. The moment you believe in Christ, which means trust in what he's done for you, is the moment you receive him. So these are not two different steps. You know, first you have to receive, and second you have to believe. These, these are synonyms. And it sort of becomes obvious because as you go to verse 11, towards the end of the verse, so that they will believe what is false. You go to verse 12, middle of the verse, who did not believe the truth. So their believe is used twice. Receive is used once. Believe, verse 11. Believe, verse 12. Receive, verse 10. So believe and receive are, are synonyms, different word, same meaning. These passages in 2 Thessalonians 2 are explaining the mechanics of the apostasy, how it plays out, and the dynamics of it. But his narrative calls for there to be no apostasy in this chapter because he wants to make the apostasy equal the rapture. So he has to explain away what it is really saying here by making receive just a synonym for believe. Verse 10 says, because they did not receive the love of the truth. John 17:17 17, 17 tells us, Thy word is truth. If you're not going to receive God's word and take his word for what it explicitly says and then begin to play semantic games with God's word to make it say whatever you want it to say, then I'm afraid you don't have a love for the truth. Now let me share with you an illustration. I received a letter from the postman a few weeks ago. I received it but does that mean I believe it? Also, does that mean I obeyed it? Of course not. Each word has a specific meaning. I received the letter, but I didn't believe it, at least not fully. In fact, it was based on some misinformation. I had to dispute it and have it corrected. It was a bill. I had not obeyed the letter either, at least not until I had paid the bill. Once I had paid the bill, then I could say I had obeyed it. These words do not mean the same thing in our common everyday use, nor do they mean the same thing when it comes to scripture. Could you imagine me going up and just saying, hey, I received the, I received the letter. That means I obeyed it because they're the same thing, you know? Do you think that would work for me in the real world? Of course not. And it doesn't work when it comes to scripture. Remember, Greek is even more precise than English. Each word was used for a reason and each has a particular intended meaning. No, these words are not synonyms for one another. Now, there may be a correlation between words, but that doesn't make them synonyms. It's like glasses, you know. You put them on, and you see things that, you know, it blocks other things, and, and you just focus on what these glasses show you. And the, 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 the whole point of, you know, being a Bible student, a Bible teacher is, is constantly having to remove, you know, any lens that we have. And I admit, you know, there are lenses I, I we all have to throw away because of how we are brought up, how we denominational, what we heard, who's the teacher that we were listening and constantly have to not revise your, your, your belief system in a sense of like having to change your whole mind, but having to like purify it and purify it and purify it. And to the point where you get rid of lenses that that uh, that block certain things from your view, and um, you know that this is what what Andy does is it, it, if you look at the Bible through his lenses, you will end up with exactly what he's teaching. You know, it, it is a, a once always saved idea, right. uh, pretty, pretty extreme, like like Joseph Prince, and you will end up with a pre tribulational rapture which denies, you know, other things by making things synonyms, right? You know, it denies, it denies the reality of persecution and it denies the reality of, um, you know, an apostasy. It denies the reality of an antichrist. And I'm not just referring to people that, that don't, you know, classic pre-tribulation, but he, he's pretty, pretty, um, he's pretty uh, radical in terms of, and, and I think that's why it gives him a pass. It gives a pass to people that, 
fulfill those two things. He messes around with soteriology and he messes around with eschatology, which are the two things that Paul addresses in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, you know? So you, you got a choice. You either believe what Paul said or what Andy Wood says. And, you know, it's it, yeah. it's apostasy and antichrist uh, comes first. Or is Andy Wood's right, where he says, no, it's the rapture. And there is no apostasy and there is no antichrist for believers. And so in your other. So it's interesting that it always comes down to that, isn't it? It, it always comes down to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Um, yep. If Paul is right, then Andy Woods is wrong. Very, very wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, uh, and 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 so and at some point, you know, it is unfortunate that it has to come to that. But at some point, I do believe as we enter into this, you know, as we go further down into eschatology and the last days, eventually those will be proven you know, Paul will be proven right. The scriptures will be proven right. And, yeah. and teachers will be proven wrong. Unfortunately, it'll be a time where there won't be any any joy in proving them wrong in a sense. Uh, because, you know, I, 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 th that day, I don't, want, I don't want it to come, even though I know it's coming. You know, when the Antichrist yeah. and the apostasy and, and the Antichrist come, if people still believe what Andy Wood <laughs> said at that point in time in history, they're the problem, not not, not 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 the persecution, not not the antichrist necessarily. Yeah. That'd be a big, but it's going to be the believers who don't, who will deny. You know, you know, for the yeah. for the preachers to say that this is not an issue of salvation, you know, because they say a secondary issue, secondary issue. They really put a lot of emphasis, and they're very aggressive to the to put this onto the body of Christ. You know, it's not obviously we know yeah. it's not a secondary issue, even if they say that. You know. Uh, they attack those who disagree with them. It's all out of proportion for being a secondary issue. I've never seen a secondary issue be this, yeah. put it this aggressively. And, and and it is permeating the, the the body of Christ more and more. Obviously, there's been some pushback, of course, on, on because of pre-wrath yeah. pre, pre and, and, of course, post-trib and, and the issues that are going on in the world. But, um, you know, it, it's it's the timing seems to be now a more critical question. I believe that's why it's ramping up this. I think that the, the devil is really ramping up this stuff because yes. it's becoming a question in our modern time that if it's true because of the, the apostasy, because of the apostasy in yeah. second, Thessalonians, it's becoming a critical issue because it, it, if it's a fallacy, then it, leading to pervert a critical warning from scripture yes. you know, by Jesus. Absolutely. So, yeah. There are consequences to that false doctrine. So we're the closer we move to that target of Jesus is coming, then that question becomes more critical. Yeah, probably in and of itself, you know, completely in a vacuum, secondary, tertiary issue, you know, timing, you know, as long as we believe and trust in Jesus and we know we're going to go through difficult times, you know, when do you describe when he's coming or not? You know, it, it probably wasn't that much of an issue, but the critical mass is, is approaching, right? We're about to hit critical yeah. mass. And so that becomes even more important now, the consequences and the, the perversion of the warning. That's my concern, the perversion of the warning yeah. and the fact that uh, the, these men put themselves as, as, as teachers of, of, of the church and, and they're perverting it. And the consequences are un unbelievable. And we're talking about yes. the apostles. We'll talk about that next time. So. Now, we have barely begun to scratch the surface here. The synonyms go on and on. Now, when someone has to change a word or redefine it in such a way to make or prove their point, turn away from them. Don't even listen to them. Wasn't this Satan's strategy right from the beginning? Back in the garden in Genesis 3 1, didn't he say, Has God said? God didn't really say that. You shall not die is just a synonym for you shall become like God. Now I'm being facetious here, but I'm hoping you'll get the point. In closing, these words from Peter come to mind. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. 
You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Please, I urge you all, prayerfully consider everything that you hear from anyone, making sure it always lines up with Scripture. Not a text out of context, without co-text, but measure it against the whole counsel of the Word of God. Thank you for watching and God bless you all. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way.